Chris Myers from Control Talk Now. We are absolutely thrilled to be starting a new series called Tech Talk with Johnson Controls. It's going to be a monthly event. We are so pleased. We have our guest today is Chris Lane from Johnson Controls. Chris, welcome to Johnson Control Tech Talk on Control Trends. Thanks, Eric. Glad to be here. Well, we're, we're using Google Hangouts, uh, and, and if anybody has not used that yet, there, there's a little bit of a trick to it, right, guys? We've been trying for the last 15 minutes to get this up and going, but it looks like we're live now, Chris, so um, ready to rock and roll. Kenny, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good, Eric. Thank you. Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, welcome to the show, sure. and uh, let's get started. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's catch everybody up on the uh, what's new with N2, the legacy, uh, and what can we expect in the very near future with the N2? Okay. Yeah, so we announced uh, several months back the, uh, the long-term phase-out of some of our legacy N2 controllers that uh, were marketed and brought to market back in the early 1990s, mid-1990s. So some of, and they were under the, the Metasys ASC controller family name, like our UNT unitary controller, uh, the VMA1400, uh, the DX9100. Those are probably our three most popular legacy N2 based controllers and uh, uh, we're, we've started a, a, a long-term phase-out approach of those controllers. We've had some component supplier disruptions caused by things that were out of our control. There was a, uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a tsunami in Japan that wiped out our processor factory and, and uh, it was time to really kind of sunset those products anyways. They're reaching the end of their, their useful life so we had started a plan to find replacement strategy for those controllers and uh, coming this fall we'll have the ability to flash our existing FXPC controllers which today are our BACnet MSTP uh, communicating controllers but coming this fall we'll have a firmware update that allow you to flash them so that they can operate as N2 and the cool thing about that is, is so if you do have an existing N2 installation and you really don't want to rip out all the controllers, you just want to kind of extend the life of it by replacing one or two of the controllers, one or two of the UNTs, or one or two of the DX9100s. You can put on one of these N2 based uh, FX PC controllers, like a PCG or a PCV via V controller. And then as your trunk load of controllers might hit a tipping point, like maybe you've reached, you know, 80% of your trunk has now been replaced with our newer technology. Now maybe you want to flash them all back over to MSTP. Take okay. advantage of all the, uh, the, 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 the technology advancements that have been made in, in communicating protocols like BACnet that communicate at higher baud rates and, and have more fidelity to their data model than our legacy N2 stuff. So our, I think we've got a really interesting approach to supporting our existing customers uh, with their replacement needs and then giving them an opportunity to move those installations forward to the latest and greatest technologies. Oh, that's and that's great what stuff. Out this fall, so look forward to, to releasing that and, and getting that out the door. Well, absolutely. And, and I tell you what, it, it's like uh, N2 has been around so long. I know that uh, our listeners are going to be really, really happy that they can, that migration path that you guys have. Chris, talk a minute, if you would, about, uh, for our listeners who might not know, uh, you know, you got the Johnson branch, you got the channel that comes through distribution. If you could just real quickly sort of sum that up so that if, if a user's out there listening, maybe he's working with the Johnson branch or maybe he's working with the distributor or a contractor might want to work with the Johnson branch, you guys sort of have uh, really, in my opinion, offer users the best of all worlds. Could, could you speak a bit about how that works? Sure. In, uh, in North America, we go to market via two channels of distribution. Uh, one channel is with our wholly owned Johnson Controls owned branch organization, and the other channel is through independent distributors and contractors like yourself. And uh, uh, to try to minimize the conflict between those channels, we offer a, a differentiated product solution into both of those channels. So we have what we think are the top two uh, brands of building automation control systems out there Metasys, which we sell through our wholly owned branches and then Facility Explorer, which we sell through our independent channels, our distributors and our contractors. And uh, it's actually, uh, you know, it's about nine, ten years old since we've launched our most recent, um, uh, or, or launched that program in its most recent form, and it's been a, a, a tremendous success for us. Um, uh, we've, we've been able to create two 
very powerful control offerings with you know very good technologies uh, through two different completely different channels and I think that we've been able to minimize the amount of channel conflict that, it, that occurs region by region, office by office in the market as they try to go after project work. So we have a, you know, a dual channel, dual product distribution strategy. It's been working out for us really well and uh, something that uh, we intend to support going forward. Well, you know, Kenny and I are both uh, Johnson Controls distributors and have been for, for quite some time, and, and I can attest to that. You guys have done a really good job uh, about keeping those channels separate and really, uh, in my estimation, offering the user, like I said earlier, the be best of both worlds. Now, Chris, will those products mix at all? So if there's a user that uh, maybe wants to go and work with the branch, but he's got an FX system in, there are ways that the systems can interact if, if they have to. Is that correct? Yes, and actually the two systems do share a lot of under a lot of the same underlying technologies. Where we've tried to focus our differentiation between the two is really at the customer facing points as well as the uh, the tool facing points. So uh, we try to create a, a differentiation at at the tools and as well as at the operator user interface. So for example, the facility explorer. Uh, supervisory controller layer uh, uses the Niagara technology as its backbone, but we've added on top of that framework a customized what we call appliance that has uh, a configuration experience that's tailored to the needs of our independent contractors and distributors we call ABCSs. Yeah. Uh, Metasys has its own tool metaphor and it's tailored around its uh, the tailing it around our branch techs and service techs. Um, and the operator interface, so again, we've made a specific choice in supporting two completely different technologies at that uh, top end of the, of the architecture. So the, the real operator facing layer is completely different. Metasys has its own operator user experience and then Facility Explorer with its use of Niagara has a completely different technology used to present its user interface to its operators. Now so, the underlying technology is really all BACnet, so there are several ways that you can get the two systems to interoperate and intercommunicate, um, but I would tell you that the most optimum way is you know, for Metasys controllers to talk to Metasys supervisory controllers, to talk to Metasys application servers, and the same thing on FX. It's really optimized to work well under the same brand, but there are definitely ways that you can make both brands uh, talk to each other and intercommunicate. Well, absolutely. And like I said, the N2 products have been around for so long and have been so rock solid. And, and the new FX controllers seem to be exactly the same way. So uh, I applaud you guys on your upgrade path, if you will. I, th I think you guys have really thought that out uh, very, very carefully and are, and are doing a nice job with it. And Chris, I, I have to say that that is really cool. Flashback to the future. I, I, we have to work on some kind of a marketing ploy there because, uh, like, Back to the Future to flash back to N2 and then flash forward. Uh, that's, that's that's a great feature. Uh, moving on to the uh, the new products, Johnson Controls is just we're very well known for having a portfolio of A to Z. Uh, every product you need in the book is available from Johnson. And uh, and Eric and I track the new new products that come out, and new thermostats especially, because it's just a tremendous thermostat market. Tell us about the new Johnson uh, wireless thermostat and how it simplifies the uh, building digital and automation markets. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that Johnson has is a very large, still, a very large installed base uh, of customers using pneumatic control systems. Um, so when we start talking about, you know, like migrating customers from N2 to BACnet, we have to still remember that customers, there are some customers that still aren't even in the digital age yet. They're still using that old pneumatic technology to operate their buildings. And one of the ways that uh, we've come up with is uh, a way to kind of gently bring those customers forward into the digital age, uh, starting at the stat level. So we've come out with our WT4000 series uh, pneumatic wireless thermostat. It's uh, uh, a stat that uh, can replace an existing T4002 pneumatic uh, thermostat. And it's a, a wireless stat, and it talks to a wireless gateway, and that gateway converts those wireless messages to BACnet IP. And at that point, your BACnet IP series of stats can then you know, be integrated into an FX supervisory controller and integrated into your building automation system. So now you ha can present information about your pneumatic system 
via a web user interface and you can do command and control over that so it's a very uh, interesting offering that allows our existing large installed customer base to gently move forward into the new age of, uh, of digital control. Very good. Uh, Eric, uh, did you have anything else? Uh, the next thing uh, we have uh, that we'd really like to talk about would be uh, what's new with the FX controllers and what's, what's going on with the, uh, the Niagara software. No, completely agreed. I, I think uh, your, your product portfolio, Chris, is very, very robust. So, yeah, let's, let's continue down that track. Okay. Uh, well, within the, uh, my direct control is the, the Facility Explorer BAS offering, and we've made some, uh, a lot of recent uh, releases over the past, I guess, year or so, uh, focusing primarily around making the uh, experience of configuration more easy. So one of the things that we learned when we started doing voice of customer and started talking to not only end customers but also our channel customers, controls contractors, and controls distributors is that what they were looking for is not necessarily more product features but maybe easier tools to enable them to take advantage of the features that we already have. So what we've tried to do is really invest in our tools and our tool functionality to make it easier for people to configure a Facility Explorer system. So for example, when we start talking about introducing some of our new N2 based uh, FX PC controllers, we'll have mechanisms in our tools to allow that migration to occur much easier than it would be if you didn't have those uh, enhancements. So when you're, you, when you're replacing like for like, an N, a like for like N2 device for a, uh, an exact replacement, you know that replacement goes fairly easy, but we're talking about changing out uh, you know, a controller that has a different, completely different technology and might have points that are described a little bit differently. And those have implications in your configuration. So we've come out with tools that allow an N2 job, uh, controller to be replaced more easily with an FXPC controller that's got an N2 interface. Um, we've come out with uh, uh, a mechanism that allows our existing FXPC controllers to be integrated into an FX supervisory controller device. So there's a lot of time that, that, that's required to map points into an FX supervisory controller, create graphics, apply trends and alarms and schedules. And we've tried to focus our, our development attention on creating wizards, um, managers within FX Workbench under the Niagara framework to allow us to to do that, to create station components almost automatically. So for example, if you've got a, a network of FX PC controllers and you want to integrate them into an FX supervisory controller, we've got a wizard that will interrogate the controller application file for all of those controllers and then automatically map in the required points or the most important points. It will automatically create graphics, graphical views for those applications which will represent the equipment they're controlling. So you'll, if, you're, if you've got a rooftop control, it'll present a, an H flow diagram of a rooftop with all of the appropriate points um, displayed on that graphic and bound to their data sources. So you know that alone, creating the graphic alone, is an incredible time saver. So as we start coming out with more and more FX PC controllers and more and more FX PCT applications, we evolve our workbench to uh, make sure that we can automatically create those station components that uh, that are aligned around those new applications. Some yeah, of the other things that we've come oh, up I'm with sorry, are Chris, I just want to make a quick comment. You know, one of the things that is really impressive about uh, about your product line, at least the feedback and getting from from integrators, is that uh, on one hand, it's very easy to configure. So, you know, a lot of times when you do the Niagara Workbench, that can be very, very, you know, sort of intimidating. But it seems like one of the things you guys have done with your product line is created it for a guy that maybe doesn't need to go in too deep and do too much customization. He can configure controllers with your, with your platform. But at the same time, it seems like you guys also have the ability to full-blown, however complicated you want to make your control scheme, he can dive right down to that workbench and do whatever he wants to. Is that a, a fair assessment? Right, that's exactly what we intended to do is uh, create what we call an appliance um, that's, that, uh, that uh, a non-skilled or, or maybe only a mediumly skilled person who maybe only does maybe one or two jobs a year and doesn't have the time to, uh, or the experience to, 
to generate you know custom uh, control applications on a daily basis. Maybe he's only doing one or two jobs a year. To be able to easily you know log into a, a an FX supervisor controller just with a web browser, you know, discover some devices, quickly add them to his database, and automatically generate the graphics, quickly add trends, schedules, and alarm uh, extensions, and configure those extensions, and quickly have a, a full-blown uh, building automation system ready to go. Now, for the, uh, the accomplished or more experienced programmer, that maybe has their own way of doing things. Um, the underlying Niagara framework that we use with FX Workbench is very powerful. Um, you know, there's there's literally no application that can't be solved with some of the the application logic features within the within that framework. So, uh, if you want to kind of bump out of our appliance and into the raw Niagara Workbench environment, we offer that as well. And so, so for your experienced and uh, train programmers who do multiple jobs a week are in there, you know, tinkering around um, and don't, you know, want to use uh, our appliance because they've got their own way of doing things. They've developed their own efficiencies, their own templates, their own predefined BOG files. They can do that. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. We, uh, we offer a, an offering that's good for both the, uh, the less experienced and the more experienced programmer. Completely agree. Well, I uh, I just want to say uh, there's, there's no uh, no mystery why you were the co-winner of the 2013 Control Trends Best Technical Support Person of the Year, Chris. I, I mean, you you make it look easy, sound easy, and you're very modest, but yet you, you carry a lot of weight, and it, it's very impressive the way you explain things, and it just sounds so uh, so easier to understand. Um, tell us about the uh, connected community and how you try to keep uh, that message going out and. Uh, now, is it easy? Is it hard? Is it getting? Is it growing? Is your is your base your connected community base growing? Oh yeah, our our our, our Pro FX community is what we call it. Our Pro FX user community. We launched it about two or three years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but uh, it was a direct response to feedback we received from our from our contracting and distribution channels, who had experienced similar forums like uh, HVAC talk. Um, your, you, the Control Trends Forum, where information could be provided um, in a uh, in a web-based uh, mechanism. So we had requ requests coming in from our channel saying, "Hey, it'd be nice if we had a forum." Or like Niagara Central is another example of of a forum that that displays information. So we had a lot of requests coming in to provide that kind of capability. And uh, at the same time, uh, here at Johnson Controls, we had a group of people who were investigating various different technologies to do just that. So it was kind of a, a serendipitous uh, experience where uh, we were getting requests for a forum. Without our knowledge, Johnson Controls uh, headquarters here was looking at just exactly that, a, a technology uh, to, to provide that kind of forum. So we selected the Jive technology and have created uh, what we call our connected community. And within that connected community, there are several forums, and one of which is our ProFX user forum. And that forum is specifically targeted for those who are in the business of selling, estimating, engineering, programming, installing, and servicing Facility Explorer products. So if you're a contractor or a distributor or an authorized system integrator, that is the place to be to get information about FX products. If you're a building owner or a facility operator, um, you're not allowed into that forum. So it's really for the people who are in the business of, of getting that kind of direct support from Johns Controls. So we launched, again, about two or three years ago. I wish I could remember the exact date, but uh, it took about two months, two or three months, for us to start getting some real uh, participation. And ever since then, it has grown dramatically. So I am a uh, I am a big proponent of anybody out there who um, is is unsure about um, participating in these kind of forums to to do so. the The activity levels that we've seen are skyrocketing. The feedback that we receive from uh, the participants and the members of that forum have been nothing but positive. Uh, we actually received a, a, a fee piece of feedback today from a, uh, uh, a new member on our forum. He said he's been in this business 39 years, 
and got a question answered like within minutes or hours and just could not believe the experience that he had after being in this business for so long that he could get an answer to a question answered so quickly. It just basically, he thought it was a godsend. Well, Chris, um, Chris, Chris I got to interrupt real quick and just say, you know, I really attribute uh, that level of service to, to what you've been doing there. Uh, so I uh, really want to acknowledge that. And, and I think that our, our integrators and our customers as distributors, uh, as well as fellow distributors, would say that's such a huge thing. So we really, really appreciate the great job you guys are doing with your, your technical support. I know you guys take it seriously. You go above and beyond, and, and it makes a difference. And I was just checking a stat here. We have uh, nearly 900 members on our ProFX user community right now. So it's, uh, it's a big deal for us. Great. Very, very cool. And we're actually streaming this live on Control Trends. So if you uh, pick this up on Google+, Plus, you can also go to controltrends.org and uh, watch the broadcast. If you have any questions for us, you can uh, text them to 404-550-9603, 404 404-550 Five five zero nine six zero three. Again, our guest is Chris Lane. You're watching and listening to Johnson Controls Tech Talk. All right, Chris, what do we have next? Well, some of the other things that we've come out recently in the FX line um, is we've adopted the the latest technology releases from Tritium. So we've moved our appliance over to support the new Niagara AX 3.8 uh, that was released uh, about a month ago. Uh, we've uh, released uh, branded versions of the, the JACE-3E and JACE-6E as our FX-30E and FX-60E. So uh, we're trying to keep uh, uh, pace with uh, the fast developing uh, releases that Tritium has. And uh, as uh, we saw with their summit uh, last month, uh, we're starting to get uh, early looks at their, their new framework. So we're excited to see what uh, what they've got coming out in about a year or so with the new Niagara 4 and the new Titan hardware platform. So uh, we're taking a look at that. And then uh, in the meantime, we've got some other things that we'd like to, uh, to do to improve our configuration workflows and also improve some of the, uh, the diagnostic capability that our users might want to have to, uh, to find out problems with their systems. Well, Chris, let me ask you a question because we ran into you out at the summit and uh, some interesting stuff going on out there. Uh, any first impressions of what you saw regarding Niagara 4 uh, and the new Titan at all? Yeah, I think the thing that we're most interested in is, uh, is they're moving to HTML5, which eliminates the need for the, the Java plugin on the browser client. Um, we've created, uh, before they had that, we created our own mobile user interface. So, uh, uh, and it can, almost configures itself. So, you know, I talked about field productivity enhancements. One of the things is that, um, a lot, you know, you can do pretty much anything you want with the framework, but it might take some time to, to do that. What we tried to do is, you know, eliminate some of the time needed to, to create some of these things. And one of the things that we focused on is a mechanism for a, a system integrator to configure a mobile-sized and a mobile-friendly user interface for his end users to interact with a, an FX system. Um, so we've actually already created a, a mobile uh, interface into our FX uh, Niagara-based platform. And we're interested to see how uh, Tritium's move to HTML5 will, will either uh, enhance that or maybe supplant that. So uh, we're excited to, to see them move in that direction because I think our customers are, are growing a little bit weary about, you know, managing all the various different Java versions of the plugins that have to go on their client browsers. Uh, and, we, and, and also, you know, more and more operators we see uh, are using their own devices, their own handheld devices to access uh, their systems. And they don't want to be tethered to a fixed workstation. They want to be able to access their, their system wherever they are in their building or maybe even from home. So uh, I think that was the, the primary takeaway I took from, uh, from Niagara 4. They do have some interesting things that they're doing with, uh, with tagging and adding metadata to points. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing will be is how uh, uh, OEM resellers like ourselves uh, can take advantage of that to make, uh, to make new offerings and, and maybe make configuration workflows that much easier. Um, you know, it'll all just depend on, you know, 
our, our investigation and what that really offers us and how we can incorporate that into our tools. Um, well, a quick question on that, since we're talking about tagging, Chris. Now, what about uh, like Haystack Connect? That's a protocol we're hearing a lot about or a tagging mechanism. Is that something you guys are looking at or is it already included in what you guys are doing? Is it something you're thinking about? It's something we're thinking about. We don't uh, include the, the Haystack uh, module as like a default with our installation, um, but it is something that we're looking at. We also had, prior to Haystack, um, uh, developing that kind of that open standard, John's controls kind of in the background had been thinking about that same thing and developing our own internal metadata standards. So we're kind of struggling with uh, uh, which ones we should we should pursue. So right now we're kind of taking a wait and see approach uh, to see what's going to be the best tagging or metadata technology that, that we should offer our customers. Because I think once we do that, we're going to be kind of bound to supporting that for a long time. So we want to make the right choice there. I do think that uh, Haystack is a, is a, a very well-received and well-thought-out um, uh, tagging standard. Uh, I'm just not sure yet whether it's the best one that we want to release as part of FX. It'll gotcha. certainly support it. I mean, Niagara Systems will support it, and if, they, if our customers and system integrators want to use that, they certainly can. But if we want to incorporate that into our uh, our official offering, that's still yet we're kind of still taking a wait and see approach. Well, so Chris, I'm going to ask you to sort of take the Johnson Controls hat off for a second. We'll put it right back on, and I want to fill us, put the philosophical hat on. And you know, one of the trends that Ken and I have been really tracking is just the big data revolution and and all the stuff that's going on with big data and the Internet of Things. And uh, uh, so I'd like to get your sort of view on, you know, what sort of trends you're seeing with that and then put the Johnson Controls hat back on and talk about how Johnson sees it. Because one of the biggest surprises that Ken and I had, as you know, last year, uh, Johnson Panoptics won the graphic tool of the year. Uh, so you guys obviously... And, you know, and that is come at that particular time and even to date, that's a branch product. It doesn't really come through distribution. So obviously you guys are really, really dialed in to, uh, you know, big data and, and custom views and, and what customers want for you guys to win that award. So uh, if you would speak to both those points, that'd be great. Sure, yeah. I mean, taking my, my John's Controls hat off, which is hard for me to do since <laughs> that's the only company I've ever worked for. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, let me just get this off, off of here. Um, big data, I think, is a, a hugely revolutionary, or will have a hugely revolutionary impact on our business. Um, uh, you know, being able to uncover nuggets of information by parsing through large amounts of data and finding key pieces of insight. Um, to either make your building operate more efficiently or to make your staff more productive. I think that's going to have a big impact on our on our industry as a whole. But I think there's you know there's tons of challenges around that, right? There's whole challenges around uh, what technologies will be used to to do that will will be used to extract the data. What tagging technologies will uh, emerge as being the leading tagging technologies? How secure is my data? So uh, I know you've talked a lot on control trends with, with Mark Petak at Linkspring about uh, IT security. I think the whole big data uh, initiative opens up a lot of concerns about security of data as well as access to that data. And then I think there's, you know, there's, uh, there's maybe other ways to skin the cat. So one of the, the benefits of big data is, you know, to find these nuggets of, of insight or of information and and maybe there's other ways to find that those same kinds of pieces of information without going to the extreme of looking through petabytes of data, right? Um, now, putting my I guess my Johns Controls hat back on, we do have a a, a cloud-based offering that we that we launched about two three years ago called Panoptics, and it has several applications that allow you to kind of look at building automation data, and then look at your energy usage. Uh, via dashboards, uh, do some custom diagnostics to see if there are problems with uh, equipment operation or to even lengthen the runtime of your equipment to, uh, to do energy and performance monitoring to, to gauge the success of a, of a performance contracting initiative or an energy solutions initiative. So we've been very successful with creating that kind of technology and getting that into the hands of some of our largest uh, customers that have lots of data 
lots of data to look for or look through. And we're also looking at ways that we can deliver those same kind of solutions, not only through our branch organization, but also through our independent channels. And that's actually something that we're investigating. You know, at this moment, uh, we've created a a, a, con a data connection mechanism uh, that we're currently testing between our FX supervisory controllers and Panoptics. Uh, and we're going to be looking at to see if there is a definitely, you know, is there a market need there for, uh, um, or a, a market opportunity for us to deliver that solution through independent uh, channels? I don't know yet, but uh, that's something that we're definitely looking at from a technology. Well, well uh, Chris, you just jumped a question. We have uh, two questions that have been texted in for you, and the first one was from Jeff. He wanted to know if, uh, as an integrator, would he be able to buy Panoptics through his uh, ABCS contractor? And I think you just answered that. You don't know yet, but a strong possibility, you think? Yep. Yeah, we're actually, you know, we're investigating. We've made good strides on, on making the technologies uh, um, interoperate and now we're working through some of the business models and and things of that name. What do we brand it? What do we call it? How much do we charge for it? What uh, what offerings are we going to have there? So those are the things that we're currently working out and we'll hopefully have some uh, some answers, some more definitive answers here in the next uh, month or two. Okay, excited. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Kenny. Well, no, I just, uh, we're getting close to uh, the, the uh, the time limits uh, that uh, I don't think we're going to be able to stop. Uh, but uh, Chris, you mentioned that uh, Johnson introduced uh, energy meters, uh, and these are now coming uh, through distribution. Uh, could you tell us a little, uh, real quickly summarize that just for our listeners? That's another new product uh, coming from Johnson. Oh, and by the way, we are streaming this, Eric. You know, on the control. No, I know. Oh, and, and I've, I've, I've gotten a couple of questions. So I got another question for Chris as soon as he answers this one from from uh, our audience. Yeah, one of the gaps in our, I guess, our, our I.O. line had been a, an energy meter offering, and we recently partnered with a, a third party to, de to deploy and deliver a new series of energy meters, our EM series energy meters. And there's uh, three or four different uh, subfamilies within that offering. Uh, they talk uh, via BACnet, or there's models that talk via Modbus. And really the intention there is to provide an, off, uh, an energy meeting, metering offering uh, to all of our channels so that, uh, you know, so that uh, energy can be measured and then brought into the building automation system and then be acted upon. So give visibility to your energy usage, your consumption, and your demand, and then allow you know, the building automation system to take action, appropriate action if needed, if you're exceeding your limits. Very cool. All right, uh, Chris, we have a question from Rob. Uh, he wants to know, uh, wireless is slow to adopt. Uh, how can a contractor be successful using wireless? Uh, what are some of the applications you see that contractors have been successful using wireless, you know, specifically your Johnson Wireless? Yeah, actually, our, our Johnson Wireless, uh, I think, uh, took off faster than expected. Uh, when we started doing some of the initial voice of customer research on wireless, there was a lot of pushback, you know, I don't trust wireless, wireless is not reliable. And these are some comments that were being relayed to us by customers who were then looking at their cell phone, you know, doing wireless connectivity to the internet. I'm like, come on, you're using wireless all the time. It's, it's, it's a pretty sound solution, right? Everybody's using wireless, whether it be cellular wireless or Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, but I think the, the, the value proposition to a contractor is really is, that it's an installed cost saving. So if you want to engineer a project, take a look at how you would engineer it wirelessly because it's a possible that you might be able to lower your installed cost, be more competitive on bid day against a wired offering from a competitor. And the reason is that you're not dealing with the, heart, the headaches of a wired installation. Now there are some projects that are more suited to say in a wireless um, uh, infrastructure and we've got lots of technical documents that, that identify you know what are some of the, the key things to look for um, you know some of the things that are always well suited for wireless are for buildings where you know running the wire link, wiring is is truly costly and invasive so if you've got a historic building or a building with marble walls or if you're in a region where the electrical install is is very pricey or requires you know low voltage wiring going through conduit like in Chicago, you know if you start taking a look at the costs of a wired infrastructure and then compare that to our product cost of wireless components, you might find 
uh, and we do find that it's sometimes and very often a, an installed cost savings. Then you get the benefit of, okay, now I've got wireless components in my building. What if my building usage changes? Uh, if, if it's a wired infrastructure, you've got to move wiring around. If it's a wireless infrastructure, I can move sensors around in the wall. I can move physical components more freely than I could if it was a wired infrastructure. Very, very cool. And, you know, we had Ed Merwin from Tritium on. I think you probably know Ed, uh, uh, you know, you know one, like you, one of the real knowledgeable guys in our industry that's been around for a while. And Ed made a prediction. He thinks it's all going to be wireless. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi was what he said, Wi-Fi and wireless here in the very near future, that Wi-Fi is just a proven technology. And, and you know, I, I'm wondering, I think he can see the day where you got controllers talking to each other uh, via Wi-Fi, and you guys already have the sensors talking to the controllers. So uh, agree or disagree with Ed that, that he thinks eventually Wi-Fi is going to just take the whole thing over? Yeah, I think there'll be probably some uh, uh, lower-level wireless protocols that are more suitable to, like, sensor level, um, but I do think that once you start getting above, like in the network automation layer and the, the application layer, that Wi-Fi, um, as Wi-Fi becomes like more of a, a mesh protocol, um, that definitely has a, a good potential of being, you know, the standard for a wireless infrastructure. And I do think that wireless in general is really the future. I think everything will eventually go wireless. I think all of the objections to wireless um, will eventually go away with you know people using more and more of it in their just their daily lives and getting more accustomed to its reliability. So this is uh, Eric Stromquist and Ken Smyers. This is Control Trends. We're talking with Chris Lane from Johnson Controls on a new feature we're having called Johnson Controls Tech Talk. Going to be a monthly thing with Chris. Chris, I guess you'll be bringing different guests on. And I sort of want to set the table a little bit in saying that uh, if you're not familiar with Johnson Controls, they offer a full boatload of products, everything from the valves and actuators to the sensors to variable frequency drives to, of course, amazing building automation control systems. So, uh, Chris, uh, uh, how are you looking time-wise? Um, do we have anybody waiting? Okay, I'm in a room, and I guess we do have some time yet here. So. Well, cool. cool. Well, as soon as we have to hop off, we'll hop off. These things are going to be pretty impromptu. So, again, if you're uh, one, of the, one of the viewers out there now and you have a question for Chris, you can text it at 404-550-9630. 404-550-9603. Uh, if you have any topics you'd like for Chris to cover on uh, future uh, Johnson Tech Talks, you can uh, send those to us at controltrends at gmail.com. Chris, we're so excited that you're willing to do this. We think this is just going to be a great format and uh, going to give us a, our, our customers and j people that might not know Johnson Controls an opportunity to find out just how awesome you guys are. Well, thanks. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. You know, I've been following Control Trends for actually quite a while, and uh, I really found it to be a very good forum. I use it actually quite a bit to do some uh, research on my competitors, you know, to see what they're doing. So I'm sure maybe one or, one or two competitors are listening to me talk about what we've come out with and our philosophy and our roadmap. But uh, it's well, really they are, good. And they're, they're, they are, and they're very envious right now, Chris. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. I, I've got your competitors texting me, go, get him off. He's too good. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just been a great forum for us to, you know, to kind of tell our story, and I'm a straight talker, so uh, uh, I really don't have much to hide and, and really appreciate any opportunity I can to, to talk about my product line and, and about what we're doing. So, Kenny, Very what nice. questions do you have for Chris? You had one or more for him, I think, didn't you, well, about the, the uh, new products? Or? We had a couple of them. Uh, it, we took them off. Uh, well, I do have one, and of course it goes back to the panoptics and the big data, and it starts with the energy meters and some of the other uh, sensors, whatever. Where, where does uh, does Johnson have a uh, a, a, a mapped out strategy of how they're going to help us participate in open ADR and take us? Uh, we, we see this coming. Uh, Eric and I follow those trends, uh, and that's one of the ones where the smart grid and open ADR and the di distributed traditional distributor and contractors. We seem we're outside of that that market. We're hoping that the, as our manufacturers uh, like Johnson become more adept and integrate panoptics say, to say into the FX uh, line, and and we integrate all our meters and everything. Uh, do you envision us uh, having a, a more of a role in open ADR in our present like uh, two-channel uh, arrangement? 
Yeah, and I think uh, uh, um, it'll probably depend on, and I think it will happen at some point, but the the whole adoption of, of open ADR and doing automated demand response. So as we start seeing the demand from actual customers that want to participate with their utilities in demand response activities, uh, we'll definitely have to start supporting that through all of our channels. Um, so when, when a building automation system offering is delivered, whether it be Metasys through our branches or FX through our independents, you know, I would definitely see that there's going to be, you know, a customer demanding, okay, I want that building automation system to respond to demand response events and actions that are being communicated to you by my preferred utility or by my preferred demand response server. So, I mean, you know, it, I think that's definitely a possibility. I don't have anything to definitely to share what, what we're doing in that area today. I do know that uh, that the Niagara framework does have an open ADR driver that does talk uh, to an Acuacom demand response server. I don't think we've had a, a customer order it yet, uh, but the, cap the technical capabilities is there. Whether the actual um, end customer demand is there, I think, is, is still a little bit uncertain. I think it will happen, but it's just not achieved critical mass yet. Last question I have, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, because uh, I see that too. Right now, it's kind of a—I uh, don't say free for all, but right now, it's just that only the people that are driven to get these results are getting these results. Where I think we need to have this more—the more we have in place when you have the controller and you have a you know, automation system and it has those already provisioned, so you can use them. And it's just a matter of enabling them like a driver. Then I think we're going to have much more uh, faster adaptation uh, and success. Uh, we were with, uh, Eric and I were out in California, we walked through San Diego with a very knowledgeable guy in the real com business, Jim Young, and he looked up at the, one of the more modern cities in America and said that even though we're, we're making progress, only about 10% of these buildings are smart buildings. So I think what that does, that gives us an opportunity, like we, we talk about competition or whatever, but there's still tremendous growth out there. And we just, we really appreciate what you do. When you humanize this product and you humanize what we're doing, people out there, I think, get an optimistic feeling that there's a lot of market out there that just isn't tapped and they just need ideas. And they need like references to how to go to you know go to market and uh, and know that there's a lot of market out there, and I think it's one of the things that Johnson does. It's very important. It gives you tools so that when you're ready and able to go get some of that market, there's market out there for you to to make a living on. Yeah, I also think you know sometimes the whole smart building initiatives and and doing things like automated demand response and and um, building wide optimization and all those strategies are sometimes. Uh, hindered or challenged by the way that we traditionally go to market. So we traditionally go to market with the controls offering either through a, 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 whole, a branch channel or through a distribution channel, but ultimately it's often through a mechanical contractor. Um, and he's relying on a specification that maybe an architect or a consultant has generated. And what that mechanical contractor is mainly interested in is executing an installation at the lowest possible cost and at the lowest possible risk. And you have to step, step back and think, are energy savings, you know, a key concern of the mechanical contractor or are they more a concern about the person that's actually buying uh, and paying the utility for energy, which is the end customer, right? So sometimes the end customer's um, benefits are a little bit diluted by the way that traditionally uh, building automation systems Great are point. here. Yeah. So Chris, I think Chris, a Chris, I couldn't couldn't agree more. I don't know whether you caught it or not. We posted a, a video. I think it was last week, Kenny, of uh, the San Francisco Public Utility Building, and it was one of the it was professionally done. But you know this this is the, one of the most modern smart buildings there ever was, and they walked through the challenges of what it took and what you said. The traditional way of going to market, they had to bypass that. And of course, being a public utility, they had all sorts of challenges with budgets and things like that. But I think you bring up a really, really good point. You got all this great technology, and you know, I'm wondering if, uh, and this is where Jim Young and the guys at Ibicon Realcom are so valuable. I think they're really educating owners to, uh, you know, what what they need to do, and uh, and, and to get this. So. Maybe you're right. I, so, you know, how would, in other words, if you're not going to go through the traditional process of a consulting engineer and then putting it out to the lowest bidder, what are alternatives owners could look at out there, some of our owners that might be watching and listening? Yeah, I mean, there are some, like, uh, design-build contractors that kind of directly work with end customers on their needs. 
Um, also, I do applaud Jim Young for educating, you know, owners of commercial buildings on maybe how to better word specifications or how to better engage with their consulting engineers and architects to make sure that their needs are being accurately conveyed in specifications. Because I will say that I'm not sure if we're going to be able to ever change the world as, as far as you know the spec world goes, but I think we can change how our how specs are worded and how much uh, emphasis the customer's needs are conveyed through those specs. Um, so definitely education is a key component of it. Uh, and maybe there are some different business models where you know customer direct or owner direct business models might be more appropriate for some of these more advanced technologies that allow them to achieve their, their outcomes like energy efficiency and, and lead certification and all the other good things that building owners really want to achieve. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. And I, I think the owners are getting more better educated and more savvy. And of course, the technology is there. So I, I like to say, Chris and Ken, that there's never been a better time to be a building owner because if you really understand what's available, uh, you've got so many wonderful choices. And uh, and I think Johnson is, is a company that offers an owner, you know, multiple choices. Come in and you can pick what you want. Yeah. Well, guys, I tell you what, I think we probably better better wrap it up. Chris has got to get out of the room. And, uh, Chris, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Thanks for our inaugural version of Johnson Controls Tech Talk. Uh, we'll be back, getting back on with you in July. And, uh, again, if you have topics you'd like to hear covered, reach out to Kenny and I, uh, controltrends at gmail.com, or you can just reach out in comments uh, underneath this post, although this is a live broadcast. Kenny and I will be posting the video. Uh, so it'll be up on Control Trends. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Ken. All right, that's it. Be sure to stay tuned this weekend for Control Talk Now. I'm Eric Stromquist. He's the man, the myth, the legend, Ken Smyers. And our guest has been another man, myth, legend, Chris Lane, Johnson Controls. Chris, have a great weekend. All right. Bye. Bye.